National Railway Corporation suspends operations on Abuja Kaduna rail line after attack on passenger train. The big questions are who did it and what is the government going to do about it? Namdi Kanu pleads not guilty to charges of treason. A lot of drama on his stay in court as DSS bars senior members of Ohanes in Digo and then lawyers. We'll also be looking at those and also analyzing uh, the major stories in the news this morning. Good morning. Thanks for joining us on The Breakfast, a Friday morning here on PLOS TV Africa. It's been a very interesting week and we thank you for staying with us all through the week. I am Osao Gyi Ogbon. And I am Messier Bopo. It's good to have you join us. How are you this morning? Very well. It's a Friday. Absolutely. And uh, I know Jide Johnson is eager to say thank God it's Friday once he joins us. But before that, let's of course start with uh, top trending stories and uh, the biggest uh, conversations going on across the country and maybe across the world this morning. We'll start with the um, one of the things that we just mentioned, the attack on the Abuja Kaduna rail line. Um, former Senator Shehu Sani was one who's one of the people who um, put the information out, um, saying he was uh, on that train. And of course, um, you know, videos and pictures emerged showing the damage done to the to the rail line and to the train itself. The story says that uh, bombs were set on the rail line by bandits and um, when those bombs exploded, it destroyed the whole front you know, so section of the train. Um, and of course, they continued to also fire uh, weapons at the driver and at the train itself. Luckily, no one was hurt and uh, they were able to make it, you know, I, I believe, um, to safety. And there you have it, pictures of the damaged train. Um, and it makes you then wonder what would have happened if the train was stopped. Um, successfully and they were able to gain access to the train um, if more people would have been kidnapped if um, you know people would have been killed um, how much money and you know valuables would have been you know taken also in the, in the process and, and those are some of the very very scary um, aspects of it um, if it was a car very likely that would have you know been the story but this is a train and luckily they were able to you know make it you know to, at least to some extent of safety before uh, the, the, event, the train eventually stopped. Now, um, you know, it just reminds me of uh, just last month, about last month, where you had the Joint uh, Committee on Land and Transport, uh, you know, coming to Lagos to inspect uh, the Lagos Ibadan Railway. And I actually put a question to the director, the managing director of the corporation at the time, asking him what measures have been put in place, you know, to protect the tracks and the clips against attack. That's because, you know, at the time when we were, were on board on that particular train, there was an imminent threat. Uh, it might not be necess anything necessarily serious at the time because you could find some teenagers who were throwing stones and all sort of stuff, you know. And, and so that actually, I became very curious. Uh, it's quite unfortunate to see that happen. But the big question still remains, maybe, you know, one would be thinking that following all of the attacks, I mean, following all of the, um, you know, theft, I'll call it theft, vandalism on the rail um, tracks across, uh, you know, the country, especially where you, were, where you have railways, right, uh, we would have been proactive. We would have started looking at having measures to ensure that, you know, the tracks are protected. Yes, I know that, uh, you know, there's also protection, security provided uh, before you board, checking in and all of that. But what happens? Because the, the railway, I mean, this track cuts across residential areas. Yeah. I'm thinking anyone, anyone can actually launch an attack. Anyone could just feel very uh, dissatisfied. It could be anybody, yeah. just as it happened the other day. So, uh, as soon as I saw that particular report, it just reminds me of the question and I act. And as usual, there's always an answer, but it's just an answer or we're very deliberate. All right. Let, let, let's quickly watch, um, you know, a, a very short clip and um, then I'll share my thoughts on it when we come back. All right, and uh, that's, um, you know, uh, pictures and um, a short video showing the damage to the rail track. 
um, you know, that eventually, um, um, you know, of course, that we were speaking about. And you can already tell how powerful these explosives are to be able to tear through that, you know, the thickness of that metal um, and almost, you know, stop the train from moving. Um, it's, it's a really, really scary picture, you know, and, and to be honest, you know, and this is me personally th saying, I, 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 it's not to sound, you know, like you're know, a negative person, but I had in the past imagined that these things will happen, um, mostly because of the way, you know, like you said, you know, the amount of security and the amount of effort that we actually put in to ensure that these, you know, uh, um, you know uh, these aspects are checked. Um, and I didn't see that we had done enough as a country to ensure that we had, you know, completely secured everyone who was going to be on, on a train across Nigeria, especially along the Abuja Kaduna Highway, Abuja Kaduna Rail Line. Um, so I'd expected that this will happen. But what this really says now is that people are scared to travel by road um, because they don't have money for ransom. Um, and they also <laughs> want to be victims of the band. And so they decide to go by train. Now, the railway, railway corporation has suspended, you know, rail uh, travel, you know, along that road, I believe. And um, it means that you are forced back to the road, you know, if you have to go between Abuja and Kaduna. And it's either you have enough money for ransom or you have, you know, very, very strong prayers um, to be able to make it, you know, back Paris? and forth. Yeah. Well, I mean, what other options do Nigerians have? You pray that, you know, you can make it home, you know, along that route without being kidnapped on, on the road. Um, it might also be one of the reasons the bandits have carried out this attack. And, and, and I hope we're going to be speaking with your host Agetsu this morning to understand if this shows their capabilities or their frustration, to understand exactly what is playing out here. Um, maybe they're trying to get people back on the road or they really were just trying to take advantage of the lack of security. If you remember also a couple of years ago, I think this happens, luxurious buses going from Benin to Lagos or you know, any part of the country used to have armed men on, on, um, on board. Mm. I think it still happens, you know, armed with AK-47 uh, rifles and all of that. So do we then need to, you know, get armed men on board uh, the trains or not? Um, railway isn't safe, road isn't safe. You might say, okay, well, air travel is safer, but not for a large percentage of Nigerians can't afford to travel by air. And also, uh, the government still hasn't been able to give Nigerians 100% clarity that the bandits do not have high caliber, um, you know, anti-aircraft weapons, um, you know, that makes our air travel completely safe. You know, um, there's this thing that's, uh, or the phrase, uh, experience is the best teacher, but over time that's been faulted, saying leveraging on other people's experience would be the best teacher. Yeah. Now, one would expect that the Nigerian government, yes, it's a good development, we're saying, okay, well, we have the railways working, we're trying to improve that to have other means of transportation, but you also need to look at it way back. Uh, you know, the locomotive, the, the rail train has always been, you know, a target for terrorists, although we still call them bandits in this part of our climb. Yes. So one would expect that we should understand that as soon as we have all of these facilities, it's important that we begin to put out security measures, you know, to ensure that um, the railway system is protected because it will happen, especially at the time where you have a lot of insecurity issues. So what happens? What, why have we, we um, you know, taken that action? Why have we taken that step? Why have we, we acted? Because oh. you would begin to look at antecedent, not necessarily in Nigeria, but in other parts of the world. And then you begin to, you know, plan towards ensuring that that does not become. But as usual, you, oh, we are deploring security officers across and then we're going to have, but none. Well, we'll see what the government's uh, response is to this. Um, final thing I'll say on this is, um, you know, we, we borrowed billions of dollars. Uh, which we still have to pay. You know, yeah, and to you know pay. it's going to... Currently, they're suspended. Um, um, so it's going to... Suspended. So I'm not sh sure what that means because we borrowed billions of dollars. But the thing is, no matter how much money you borrow, in an environment that is not secure, there would never be development. So you borrow billions and billions of dollars, trillions even of dollars. If you cannot secure the environment that those funds are going to be invested in, you're wasting your time and you're wasting your money. So are, you saying, no so are you saying the priority over time has it not has been very always, right? Yes, it has to be security. Before we start getting into... I mean, both you know, can work hand in hand. You can do both at the same time. But security is of, of, of utmost importance. No matter what you build, if it's not in a secure environment, nobody is going to be going there and there will be no business that will be done successfully in those areas. I totally agree with you. All right. Moving on from uh, the Abuja Kanda now, we'll be talking a little bit more about that um, as a part of our discussions this morning. Now, let's talk about um, uh, the uh, trial of Namdi Kano. He eventually did make it to court yesterday. Um, and uh, you must have seen pictures and videos um, on the internet. 
uh, but there was a little bit of drama after lawyers and uh, journalists were barred from entering the courtroom. Um, stories that I saw said that uh, they had stopped every court case from going on until about 2 p.m. when they were sure that they were either done or they were, in, you know, um, done with Nabi Kanu's case or uh, at least, you know, some progress had been made. And there was some controversy seeing men of the DSS in court, um, ensuring that nobody enters the courtroom, including some lawyers, uh, well, meant to be uh, representing Namdi Kanu. Um, and so, yes, there was some, some controversy there. Some people have said, though, maybe it was just, you know, a thing the DSS does to instill fear and to, you know, make all, you know, maybe to make the environment safe because of the caliber of a person that they bring into court. Um, nobody really knows exactly what the reason is. Um, but, of course, that was some of the drama that occurred yesterday. Well, you can take out the fact that the court is a public place and we are in a democratic dispensation and that doesn't really tell well of us because at some point it's already beginning to feel like uh, we're probably in a military, you know, kind of era. And that's not correct. So it calls for a lot of concern at this point in time. I, I'm, I'm totally, really, really disappointed personally that that's my opinion. And, you know, one would expect better. Why would you um, not allow journalists in? Why would you not allow the lawyers in? I mean, we should, if you think that um, this person would actually pose a serious threat or you feel that um, anything can happen, th that's the more reason why we should have, you know, um, some sort of security measures. I mean, they should be able to, to uh, find other means because the excuse cannot be the fact that, oh, because of the caliber of person involved, maybe, um, you know, X, Y, Z is going to happen. That's not an excuse. No, well. Um, we'll continue to follow up. And, you know, most important, you know, is, you know, the call for a free and fair trial. Uh, regardless of whether they want journalists in or not, regardless of how much DSS presence, it, it has to be a free and fair, and fair trial. And that's what um, really is the most important. Um, you're shocked, I'm really not, because it's not the first time that, you know, the DSS... I'm is, very is, shocked. You know, is, <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not the first time that we're seeing, you know, them acting this way. Also not the first time that we're seeing security agencies disrespecting, you know, the court in any way. If you remember before he was um, eventually granted bail long ago, a couple of years ago, there was some drama in court where he was, they, they tried to rearrest him. There were scuffles, punches being thrown, you know, and uh, tears, uh, clothes being torn, you know, right in the courtroom. It was totally disrespectful. So it's not the first time. Mm. Anyway, um, our final... Um, top trending story this morning moves to the United States where former U.S. President Donald Trump has, of course, gone ahead with plans to launch his own social media network and it's called Truth Social. He claims this is, um, you know, to give a voice and give, um, you know, um, a space where uh, people can air their views that will be completely free from the shackles of the, you know, you know, stereotype and the regular uh, media organizations, the Facebook and the Twitters, um, you know, of this world. If you remember, after the insurrection on the 6th of, um, 6th of January, I believe, yes, um, his uh, social media account was uh, deleted and he was barred from Facebook and from Twitter. And you can still see, even till date, that there are people who are still suffering some of those, um, you know, the, the hammers of Twitter and, and Facebook. If you quote a thing by Donald Trump or you post some of the things um, that he's speaking about, you, you will... You could be flagged down. Yeah, you could be flagged down, either suspended. And I saw someone uh, say something like that uh, this morning, that their account was also suspended because they posted a message from, you know, Donald Trump. Um, and so he is talking about Trump, uh, rather truth, social, uh, very likely would be launched in the first quarter of 2022. Uh, but it's already available for uh, pre-order on um, um, Apple, I believe, and um, you know the app stores. Um, and so if you are a fan of Donald Trump and you want to hear um, from his social media account, you, you, you cannot, you know, you can't. I, I feel that this is a capital. Avoid you know, talking about how relevant this person is in the whole political conversation. I, I kind of find Donald Trump very interesting, trust me. And uh, I feel like this is a capitalist system, so it's fine. It allows for competition. He has actually stated his reason why he's going to have that. So it's not a big deal. But I'm sure that for everything that you have, there should be some form of, um, you know, rule, I mean, some guidelines, yeah. okay? So uh, uh, we'll be looking out for what exactly that will be. Would it be also a space that would allow for the abuse of human rights and all sort of issues, as it were? Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully, you know, it, it turns out good. But I know that that's going to have a lot of followership because yes, even in will. Nigeria, you have a lot of people who are fans of Donald yes, Trump. Yes, it will. You know, it would just be interesting to see the type of conversations that would be had on that site, you know, and mm -hmm. if it's going to be open to everyone or just going to be open to people who really are... It's the same thing we talked about with cool. Was it cool? I, I think it's going to really be, uh, this is me thinking right now, and I think it's 
cool here. You're yeah, it was cool. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's really going to be about um, you know the opposition. You know, apparently now the current government, especially in the United States of America. So it's really, really going to be about you know, opposition kind of stuff. Yeah. You find that a lot, even in our space where you have, uh, you know, the opposition. So it's rather going to be like having an opposition in the media space, uh, you know, social media, we'll be uh, countering so. all of the things that they're yeah. doing or speaking against all of the eels. And that might also be a strategy because he said he has an interest, you know, in coming in through, running again. Uh, running again. So that might just be a big tool for him, you know, to come back. It'll be interesting to see. Um, and also one of the things that he mentioned, it says uh, in quote, we live in a world where the Taliban has a huge presence on Twitter, yet your favorite American president has been silenced. This is unacceptable. And, and you know, if you, if you listen to that, you might I'd say, yeah, he does have a point, um, you know, with that, because there are, and, and it's not just, it's not just the Taliban, on Facebook and on Twitter, you would see that there are some accounts, there are some pedophile accounts that have not been silenced, there are some pages, there are some channels that you see and you're completely shocked that these things exist on these platforms. But I think it was mostly because, and of course, including the Taliban and uh, some of their members, um, it, I think it's mostly because of the danger that it posed and his, his rhetoric and his narratives and the things that he was doing um, and the things he was saying, rather, the danger that it posed to the American society. And that's why I believe those social media giants decided to take that action, including, of course, the lives that were lost in the insurrection on the 6th of January. Um, those are the reasons that they eventually had to take that um, action. The Taliban and being on Twitter or on Facebook doesn't necessarily pose an immediate danger mm. to the American society. And so they can, you know, maybe it doesn't care. And really just tells you that American interests will always come first to the American uh, government. Definitely. Regardless. It, I, I don't even think it's about the Americans. Usually, you know, when state actors come together, they would always act in their interest. That's what it is. So uh, I don't know, maybe we'll make an exception for Nigeria because if we come together as, you know, countries, you would always think about your interest first, home interest before every other interest. Even though, although we all constantly talk about, you know, global, uh, globalization, you know, global prosperity and all of that. But at the end of the day, selfishness is always what it is. Yeah, it's not where we need to go. It's, it's uh, for the Nigerians. Um, um, do, you, do you think we'll always put ourselves no. first? <laughs> I, think we, I think we put, I think the Nigerian government puts itself, the people in government first, not the Nigerian state. Not the Nigerian people. Some the sort people of interest. Itself. Some sort of interest, however. <laughs> All right, we need to go. We'll take a short break. When we come back, GD Johnson joins us with uh, Off the Press to share stories, uh, or his views rather, on the major stories making headlines across the country this morning.